QSO Today, episode 415, Bill Jordan, AE4S. This episode of QSO Today is sponsored by ICOM America, makers of the finest amateur radios and accessories for your ham radio station, and by Nuts and Volts magazine. A few notes before we get started today. We have over 40 exciting presentations for the next QSO Virtual Ham Expo coming September 17th and 18th. Tickets for the expo are $10 and are on sale now for this event. We also offer a scholarship program for kids and qualified students. If you have a project that you would like to share in the expo without preparing a speaker presentation, look no further than our new project gallery. That includes a self-service kiosk for your paper, article, poster, video, and downloadable content. This is a great way to share or seek attention to your project. Click on the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo banner in this week's show notes page for more information. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth. Amateur call sign 4Z1UG, where I demonstrate the diversity and relevance of the amateur radio hobby and its impact on society by interviewing ham radio operators, many of whom played vital roles in shaping our technology through the amateur radio hobby. And while many people might say, ham radio, do people still do that? This podcast demonstrates through in-depth interviews just how amazing, diverse, and dynamic the amateur radio hobby continues to be. Thanks for your email comments and remarks to my episode 413 with Connor Black, W4IPC, and CJ Pokowitz, WW0CJ. It opened my eyes to how out of touch I am with young people in the USA. Here are my takeaways that could be the basis of your conversations with your radio clubs. 1. Helicopter parents don't trust old men. We have to build that trust. 2. Kids don't make their own money anymore, so barriers to entry are test and license fees and the cost of getting on the air. 3. Kids don't read books or magazines, so YouTube content is essential at the beginning. I would challenge that assertion with a monthly delivery of paper magazines like On the Air and Nuts and Bolts by Snail Mail. 4. VHF UHF free radios for kids in communities where there is a concerted effort by hams listening to the local repeaters to reply to them when they ask for radio checks to try out new radios may be effective to involving young hams into the amateur radio community. Dead air kills excitement for the new hobby. 5. Ham clubs are boring unless they include activities at each meeting. The business of clubs, like the minutes of the last meeting and the treasurer's report, can be done on Zoom. 6. Follow-up after the license is awarded is key where an Elmer befriends a family with a new ham to build trust from the new ham and the parents and to provide expertise. 7. Episode 413 may have left the impression with the young hams who listen to it that the only way for them to get on the air is with a new ICOM IC7300 or a Flex Radio 6700 costing at least $1,000 and up. After hearing this impression from youth in emails, I conclude that their lack of mentoring allowed them to draw the wrong conclusions. I would argue that the absolute best rig for a beginner is the worst possible rig under the mentorship of a senior ham. All of us who were novices had this experience, and it was invaluable. 8. Radio clubs with young people need to make them youth ambassadors who reach out to youth that show up to meetings, making sure that they are introduced around and that they have a mentor to pursue their interests. The lack of mentoring and the ability for young hams to ask for help is to our detriment. I look forward to your comments, but I sincerely hope that you will use my comments to start these conversations in your radio clubs. And now let's get to this week's interview. Bill Jordan, AE4S, love of electronics and radio, paralleled his professional career as a college professor. As a founding member of the Tallahassee Amateur Radio Society and the AE4S repeater, Bill is connected and communicates with lifelong friends he has made through ham radio. AE4S tells his ham radio story in this QSO today. AE4S, this is Eric, 4Z1UG. Are you there, Bill? Hi, I'm here, A4S. Name is Bill. Nice to meet you, Eric. 
Nice to meet you too, Bill. Bill, we met at the Dayton Hamvention last May, and I met all kinds of the high priests of amateur radio, including you. So I'm very happy to meet you, Bill. I'm, I'm grateful that you're coming on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? When I was always interested in mechanics and electronics, my neighbor was a an X-ray scientist with Bethlehem Steel Company. This is my father was a middle management engineer with Bethlehem Steel, and so my neighbor was into basic television and using radar X-ray to examine steel beams and look for metal fatigue and, and impurities. And he would shift me off the equipment that he didn't, that he had found surplus, for example, uh, a battery charger that consisted of a very large diode tube and, um, and, and then alligator clips that would go to a battery. And then I could make a magnet out of wrapping, uh, wrapping a wire around a, uh, a, uh, a pencil and um, and interrupting the the flow of the of the battery and um, it was a very primitive experience but it was playing with 12 volts not 110 so I was on the safe side of that that was the start the diode the huge uh, diode tube that went to the fire that was the fire that started the whole thing was the hometown Bethlehem Pennsylvania yes. Yes, I like to tell people it was Bethlehem and Palestine, but uh, very few people believe that. I refer them to the good book, and they they refer me to their own, <laughs> their, their own better prospects. Well, you know that listeners to the QSO Today podcast know that if I look out my window, I can actually see Bethlehem, Israel, which is just down the valley here. So you're close to it. Yes, I feel close now. I feel it. You can feel it. Okay, so you grew up in Bethlehem, and you had this neighbor. Would you say he's an X-ray engineer? Yes. He died of radiation poisoning, as a matter of fact. So he, he, was, really a, he was really an experimenter and extraordinary guy. He had a, a tower that he put up um, between our houses, and I used to climb the tower. And it, was, it had TVs on top. TV antennas on top of it, and he was able to get New York and Philadelphia, and we didn't even have a TV. We didn't, I, I was the one that bought the TV for the house when I was 14 years old and traded a shotgun that I had for a, for a, TV, a used TV set, marveled at the fact that I could watch movies, and it didn't cost me a, a penny, and it was 2 o'clock in the morning, and it was just a raw thrill for me. He was probably the original cable TV operator with his tall tower and the ability to bring that signal down. Yes, he was an amazing guy. He, he, he had the, the TV set was, he had three screens on it. One was blue for the sky and one was sepa tone for human beings. And then there was the green for the grass. And it didn't matter what the scene was. It, was, it had green, green floors and blue ceilings. Whatever was the newest, he had the newest. So you had an interest already in technology. How did the interest in radio develop, or did that kind of evolve? Well, radio was a, a real interest of mine. I was in Boy Scouts, and I the, the idea of communication was was really meaningful to me. I had a I had a field radio that I I ran a wire from my bedroom bedroom window over. To uh, across the street, across two streets, through the trees, to my neighbor's window. She was a, the best friend that I ever had. There was nothing of a love interest there. It was just she was a, a, a really good buddy, and we talked on our field radios um, every night with this, a single wire, and the other wire was attached to a pipe that went into the ground. It was a, an evolving experience, and it. It had to do with my personal life as well. My social life consisted of a field radio at the time because I wasn't back then. We we had one telephone and I wasn't allowed to use it because that was strictly for my father and my mother. So my field telephone was my communication with the outside world. So that was like surplus field phones. Yes, it was sound powered. Yes, it was sound powered. 
or it may have had dry cells. It, as a matter of fact, I think it had dry cells in it. And you crank it to, to get the attention of the other person. But it was just miraculous to be able to have a private line to your girlfriend. Well, I can say that I had a similar arrangement with the girl next door. I can tell you that at the time, that was really an amazing thing. It was an amazing thing in the early 60s to be able to have your own private telephone network. Well, you're a child, of course, uh, compared to me, and this was in the 50s. So we're talking about the, the late 40s and early 50s that I was doing this. This was war, sur war surplus goods that I managed to get my hands on. I don't even remember how I came across it. But then uh, I wanted to be a ham, and I, I made a little crystal set, and my father showed me the gallium crystal, and we put the cat's whisker on it, and we could hear all the local, the, the local station, there was only one radio station that was in the area. And so the idea of electronics was, 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 was not dormant, it was evolving. When I went to school, when I went away to college, I wanted to be a mechanical engineer. I had a, an appointment to the Naval Academy, which I, I didn't take. I went to Cornell instead and studied economics and philosophy and liberal arts instead of and physics and mathematics but I, it wasn't much in the way of electronics and engineering was an entirely different school and that was a five-year program my father told me I had four years in college not five years so it was uh, it was four years and out and into the Navy but the Navy was all electronics for me too because uh, I went into aviation and in the naval aviation, you not only fly the airplanes, but you have to have some other function in the squadron. You don't have people who are who are the mechanics, the, the uh, electricians, the the admin officer. That you had or the personnel officer. You had regular pilots that were were all of those things. They had all of those functions. So. I was the avionics officer for my squadron. It was a big squadron. There's a hundred and some people in it. And I was the avionics officer for it. I didn't know much about avionics, but I had to act as if I did. I learned from my chiefs, my senior enlisted people. I, I learned how to read schematics and, and uh, I, I learned how to solder. And back then it was... It was all hands-on. You had components. There wasn't any surface-mounted stuff. And you had tubes that you had to work on. And these tubes had to get on an airplane and take a crash landing into a carrier deck. So the filaments were always breaking out. And it was, uh, it was an interesting job. And it was a fulfilling job. Let's just go back just a little bit. Did you have siblings? I had a brother. I have a brother and I have a sister. My brother was an economist. He went to Columbia and got his PhD. My sister is a lawyer. She was a mean lawyer, uh, still is a mean person. She's just turned 89, so she's, but she's mean in a, in a sisterly kind of way. Like, she's my big sister, and she lets me know that. As only a big sister can. Yeah, as only a big sister can, and with plenty of practice. Did they have any interest in technology and electronics along with you, or was this kind of your own interest as a child growing up? Well, my brother was very interested in music, and in um, he had a Marantz receiver. I had receivers that I put together. They didn't have cabinets. They just sat in chassis on my desk. I still have the desk that I used when I was growing up. So th there was that interest in electronics but it was it was in mature electronics it was not embryonic electronics for my brother he wanted he wanted the very best of the the music reproduction systems and had the best still does for that matter and now this message from icom america heard it worked it logged it this summer, keep your competitive contesting edge with ICOM. Our high-powered base stations cut through pileups, letting you work the bands and log those contacts. Contest from the comfort of your home or remotely with the RSBA1 app. The ICOM IC7851 gives you a new window into the RF world, and it's 
on-air excellence is unparalleled. With faster processors, high input gain, high display resolution, and a cleaner signal, it's truly the pinnacle of HF perfection. Features include dual receivers, digital IF filters, memory keyer, digital voice recorder, high-resolution spectrum waterfall display, enhanced PC connectivity, and an SD memory card slot. The ICOM IC7610 is the SDR every ham wants. This high-performance SDR can pick out faint signals in the presence of stronger adjacent signals. The ICOM IC7610 is a direct sampling software-defined radio that has changed the world's definition of an SDR transceiver. Its features include RF direct sampling system, 110 dB RMDR, independent dual receiver, and dual digicell. Create your own band openings with the ICOM IC9700. This transceiver brings direct sampling to the UHF VHF weak signal world. This all mode transceiver is loaded with innovative features that are sure to keep you busy that include faster processors, higher input gain, higher display resolution, and a cleaner signal. This has become the new de facto standard as a baseband rig for microwave operation as well. Features include 4.3 inch touchscreen color TFT LCD, real time high speed spectrum scope and waterfall display, smooth satellite operation with 99 satellite channels, dual watch operation, and full duplex operation in satellite mode. The ICOM IC7300 is a high-performance innovative HF transceiver with a compact design that will far exceed expectations. This innovative HF transceiver digitizes RF before various receiver stages, reducing inherent noise in different IF stages. The IC7300 changed the way entry-level HF is designed. It is the go-to rig in my station now, and I love it. Features include RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, large 4.3-inch color touchscreen, real-time spectrum scope, and an SD memory card slot. Just know that you'll be very pleased with one of these fine rigs to enhance your contest, DX, and general ham radio operation in your station. Be sure to check out these ICOM rigs and their full line of base stations and portable radios at an amateur radio dealer near you. And when you make that purchase of a fine ICOM rig, be sure to tell your dealer that you heard about it here on the QSO Today podcast. And now back to our QSO Today. Did your family receive magazine subscriptions? Did you have, like, popular electronics, popular mechanics, any of those popular magazines that were available in the 50s? No. I would borrow those from friends. Popular electronics was very important to me. Uh, Popular mechanics was very important to me. It is still important to me, even though they're not being published anymore. I guess popular mechanics is still published, if you can call what what they're doing now is... As a publication, it pales compared to what what it had been. But I read voraciously. I read the American Society of Civil Engineering monthly that came in. That was of great interest to me. But the electronics was always there. And when I when I uh, got out of the Navy, first thing I did, I went to work for Merrill Lynch as a stockbroker. And and every day I rode the bus to the office. And that was a 45 minute run. This is in Atlanta. It was a 45-minute run. And so on the GI Bill, I took a correspondence course from the National Radio Institute so that I could get my first-class FCC license. So I spent a year riding the bus, reading the textbooks, and then go taking the test. I took the tests at the FAA or at the FCC buildings and finally got my first-class radio license. When I was, uh, oh, I guess it was 19, 1970, roughly, I worked on um, on two-way radios for uh, marine radios primarily, not not primarily, exclusively on marine radios. As you were also a stockbroker at Merrill Lynch? Yes. So you're doing this in parallel? Yes. And did you have an amateur radio license by this time? No. I was learning the Morse code. I went in, in into the Naval Reserve, and and so I stayed. I had continuous continuous service in the Naval Reserve from the active duty. After five years of active duty, I just went in into the reserves, and 
Uh, I again was an avionics officer. One, one of the things that I wanted to learn was Morse code. I had the electronics. I knew the electronics from my first phone license, but I didn't have the Morse code. So they had records and I'd listen to those records and I'd go on two weeks active duty and I'd listen to the records. And so I'd learn Morse code, but I didn't, I didn't have any way to get, I didn't have a, I didn't have a sponsor. I didn't have anybody that would, would mentor me into I think it's very important that that you mentor people, and I had had no mentor until I came to Florida State as a professor, as an assistant professor. My first job after uh, graduate school, I put myself through graduate school by working in a two-way shop, two-way radio shop, and working at Merrill Lynch. No, no, I I was out of Merrill Lynch. I, I did Merrill Lynch for three and a half years, and then then I realized that. I didn't want to sell refrigerators that I couldn't guarantee. I like selling. I really like selling, but I don't like selling things that I can't. I can't warrant that this this stock will make you money. You can't say that because you can't. You, you realize it's not true. You can't. Right. The SEC tells you you can't say that. You cannot say that. <laughs> That's right. By law, by law, you can't say that, or you go and you go paying money to the client. So. I was in graduate school for four years. The reason you say, how did I get into accounting? I took, uh, I went to an industrial psychologist who I wanted him to find out what my, what my abilities were and what my skills would be, what vocational, what vocational skills I could acquire. I knew I had to go back to school. So in those tests, I came out, my highest scores was in computer programming. Well, there wasn't computer programming available then. Remember, this was 1970. I'm sure that someplace, some someone was developing computers and computer programs, but it wasn't uh, officially at the school that I was going to, which was Georgia State in, in Atlanta. But the next one was accounting. And I realized that I, non- I needed to have a vocation that had me a license so that I'd always have a job so that I could pursue the things that I really wanted to do. And electronics was one of those things. So I went into accounting, and that's where I was ever since. But I never practiced accounting. I sat for the CPA exam, of course, and got that credential, still have it. When I got to Florida State University, my first job, same at the same time a guy came in into the orientation meeting with me, was a ham, uh, a ham extra, had spent four years in the Navy uh, as an electronics technician, had sat in the radio room with a, with a mill tele, tele, a typewriter typing uh, code. And so he mentored me, and first thing I knew, I was up in Atlanta taking the test, and I took the advanced test because I had the electronics down. So I took the advanced test. So I, I was an advanced um, ham in 1975, about six months after I went to work at, at uh, Florida State, and that was uh, that was the beginning of my ham career, which was really a career. It was where do I start with that? Well, don't start there yet because I have a question. So you get your first license in 1975. The advanced license for people who weren't there then was, it was 13 words a minute. Yes. It had another set of 30 questions, I think, right, on top of the general, but it wasn't quite the extra. I don't know. I know it had some heavy electronics on it. It wasn't just rules and regs. I don't remember whether it was even multiple choice. I think there were some diagrams or drawings on the test in those days. Yes, uh, circuits. Yeah. Well, Pitts oscillator, for example. I remember that uh, vividly. Those were the, the days when you had to have some. I was very proud of my first phone license because it, it made the, the ham electronics an easy test. Yeah, and that was quite a test. To work in a two-way shop, you didn't need a first-class radio telephone. You needed, I think, only a second. But did you actually use the first class? Did you ever work for a broadcast radio station or anything like that? No. Lord knows I tried. I tried to, to do the the uh, Georgia State uh, station, but the Georgia State station was so embryonic that 
they wanted somebody who could work full time, not just somebody to sign the log with the first class ticket. So I, I never did that. And what was your first call sign? Do you remember? WB4NAY. And you upgraded to extra? Yes, I upgraded to extra in three years. In the meantime, I had, I had put up a repeater. In Tallahassee? In Tallahassee. Right, which is where you ended up. Yes. What I did was I took my my finance and accounting skills and I put together a partnership that we erected a 600-foot tower for a commercial activity, a 600-foot tower to lease out to the police and the fire department and to AT&T, the sheriff, and make money on it and at the same time have the ham antennas at the very top. So I climbed that tower twice, the 600-foot tower, climbed it myself, installed the antenna on it. It got struck by lightning. I went up and installed another antenna up there, which lasted for, she 30 years, more than 30 years. So you went into the tower leasing business. Yes. For people that may not be familiar, essentially that's a 600-foot, was it self-supporting or guide tower? Probably was guide tower. It was a guide tower. So you had to have a big piece of ground in order to put that tower on it. Right. We scoped out the scoped out the land. One of the one of the partners was a lawyer. One of them was a builder, and one of them was a tower erector. And then there were two hams. Another fella and and I were the two hams, and we put up a commercial radio system at the top of the tower on UHF. And then we had a VHF and a UHF antenna at the top of the tower for the ham bands. Now, the radios weren't at the top of the tower, were they, or were they down in a building at the bottom? No. Our builder built the building, and we put a generator in, and cable racks, and all of the things that you had to do to have a commercial tower. And then you're pulling one and seven-eighths hard line or something like that all the way up the tower for your antennas? We use seven-eighths hard line. To go up, we had we had two lines going up. We eventually put a combiner in so that the the commercial people could use our antenna at the top, our UHF antenna. The commercial bands were were UHF. Um, eventually, 800 went up there as well. We had a a really good financial program going. It was it was good. We had good depreciation on it. We had good cash flow. It was a, a, a fine financial activity, except it was a partnership, and not all of the partnerships saw eye to eye. Some of them were in it for the short-term money maker, and as soon as Motorola started making noises about buying out the tower, this is what these guys wanted to have. They, these other partners, wanted the wanted their money back out and the profit and. Um, so we had to sell out. We sold out to Motorola. Did you have other sites, or was this the only one that you did? This was the only one. It was a big piece of property, and um, it's still in existence. Uh, it's now owned by Crown Castle, and Crown Castle drove us out. We had a. We stayed on there while uh, Motorola was there. We stayed. Um, we had our kept our locations. They 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 let us do the maintenance on the building and the ground. So we mowed the fields and and uh, and managed the electronics and the lightning protection and the generator. And in exchange for that, we had free roam of the location and our antennas were, and feed line were still ours. And that was until uh, Motorola got out of the tower business, sold to Pinnacle, Pinnacle was eventually bought out by Crown Castle, and Crown Castle started charging us. First of all, it was two hundred and fifty dollars a month rent to be there, and eventually it went up to fourteen hundred dollars a month. For amateur radio operators, that's a big price to pay. Yes, especially when you don't have a club to do it. But it it was uh, the premier repeater here in Tallahassee for thirty years. And we had to shut it down. Uh, there's just no way that we could we could afford that as a public service. And even as a club, there, there just there was no way that we could keep it running. Now, is Tallahassee flat, right, for the most part? 
Tallahassee has seven hills. If you go if you go south, the the terrain is about seventy five feet above sea level. If you go north, it's going to be about two hundred feet. So it's it's more of uh, it's got hills, and we had a nice hill. We were on a nice hill, so we were we had two hundred and eighty feet of elevation, and on top of that, our six hundred foot tower. So you had some really nice coverage, probably. Excellent coverage, yeah. And what happened after that? Were there buildings, high rises, water towers, anything like that that became available, or did this repeater disappear? This repeater five years ago, uh, actually it's more like seven years ago, seven years ago we had to shut down, so we removed all of our equipment. I still have it in my basement, and we kept frequency coordinator let us keep our frequencies kept looking for places that we could go and eventually wtnt a, a, a local station with a um i don't know it's 550 feet maybe 600 it may be 600 feet i'm not sure they said they would give us a no cost lease if we would take down some of their some of the old hard line that's on there from tenants that had just vacated the spot and not taking their their equipment with them. If we would uh, if we would remove that and not not add new load to the tower, we could have two antennas up there. So we uh, about oh, three years ago we went and bought uh, two new not new but um, used and I don't know what Motorola's they were. I, I see. I haven't kept up with the with the uh, with the details of the equipment. But we have two Motorola repeaters, one on VHF and one on UHF, and we we bought uh, 600 feet of hard line, and we purchased commercial antennas, put them together, put them on a guy's 75 foot tower, one of our in our group. We have a group of five people who who sponsored this now. And uh, so we're back on the air now, to make this long story shorter, we're back on the air now at 450 feet, no, excuse me, 550 feet, with a VHF and a UHF, and it's been on the air for, this is two years now, two years today that we put the VHF system online, and they've just been superb. So we're back online. I want to take a minute to tell you about my favorite podcast, the Ham Radio Workbench Podcast with George, KJ6VU, and now joined by Rod, VA3ON, Mike, VA3MW, Mark, N6MTS, and Vince, VE6LK. Every two weeks, George and company offer up a status report on the many amateur radio projects on their workbenches and explore projects on their guests' workbenches. This group is project active and prolific, covering many technical areas of amateur radio. So the next time you want a deep dive into ham radio electronic project building, or to learn about technology, tools, test equipment, construction techniques, and the rest, listen to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast available on every podcast player and channel. Use the link in this week's show notes page to get to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast directly. And now back to my QSO. Out of curiosity, because you go through a lot of places. I said this last week on the QSO Daily podcast that when I was in Dayton, I had loaded all of the repeaters in Dayton on my portable radio, thinking that with 30,000 people in town, there must be people talking on the repeaters, and there was nobody talking on the repeaters. So I'm just curious, in Tallahassee, with this new repeater system, do you actually have activity, and how do you keep that activity going? Oh, we do have activity. Our our repeater has probably more activity on it than anything in anything in town because we're always monitoring it. And anybody who comes on always has somebody to talk to. We're nobody goes on there and says this is so and so mobile monitoring that he is an answer and that we don't welcome them and encourage and make new friends. Um, we invite them to a uh, a lunch that we have underneath the trees every Thursday afternoon, um, and uh, it, it is a very busy repeater. The UHF system is the one that gets used so much, 
VHF doesn't get used so much, and I, we don't know why, except that we just VH, VHF is is UHF was up six months before VHF was up. But yeah, we we're very active, and we and we stay active because we monitor it and listen for people to come in, and we encourage we just encourage them and mentor them when the, when they do get in. So it's been a it's been a uh, a good experience for us. We set up a 501c3 corporation to manage it uh, and and give it some some perpetuity. So we'll be up there for a long time, and uh, we're very hospitable to anybody who wants to come on. Now, does Tallahassee have an active amateur radio club? Yes, we have a an amateur radio club, the Tallahassee Amateur Radio Society, which which. Uh, I was again instrumental in creating that. That's, that was the 501c3 that I was that I did when I was in my early days as a professor here. Um, and it has it has its own repeaters. It's got a six meter repeater. It's got a UHF, VHF. Uh, we do active field day. We have about a hundred members, and uh, I go to the meetings. Um, we we have active classes. We have a, a website that's not not very well provisioned. Uh, what I mean by provisioned, it's not monitored properly, and I don't think we're we're harvesting the the young hams the way we should. We really nurture the new ham to come in and participate. Uh, for field day, we had a special station for for anybody who wanted to come in and and wanted to talk. It was a it's it's been the ham club has been an inspiration to me because of how they get together uh, independently of our group, and yet we we synthesize. I mean, we 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 satisfy and, and sy- synchronize our activities so that we do overlap. And do you have a range of ages? It's not just an old man's club. It's become a representative of the community in terms of the people that are there. Yes, we do, and that's part of what our repeater tries to do. We have classes for uh, for the new ham, the young kids that want to come in. We talk to the high school. I would working on teaching a ham course out at one of the private schools here. Um, that hasn't come about yet. I'm still working on that. The our repeater tries to coordinate a lot of those young people, get them on the air, get them get them their any tone radios for as cheap as they can get and get on the air and talk to us. And it's it's been a fulfilling been, been a fulfilling activity for us. What kind of pushback do you get from the private high school when you approach them and you say that you'd like to offer amateur radio instruction? What is the feedback that you get from the school? Well, it's gotta fit into a curriculum and that's that's one of the issues. Uh uh, I I did a volunteer course in accounting, which was a credit class for uh, for the high school in a private school here uh, one year, and um, I, I tried to bring computers into that class, which is as far as I, I could get into the ham radio portion of it. But there's there's a pushback because it has to be a club. It's transients; they're moving through. They they're they're going through middle school and high school, and uh, their interests are changing. And hormones have a lot to do with with the kind of activity people choose to engage in. In their teenage years. Their teenage years, yeah. So in other words, if there's a club on campus that needs an adult sponsor or adult expertise for that club, like I think when I was in high school, it might have been Key Club or the Chess Club, what you're saying then is if there's an amateur radio club on the campus and it has an adult sponsor, then there's an opportunity. But that would have to be formed by the students with a faculty advisor. That's correct. That's problematic because we that would take that would take almost full time activity for somebody because you'd have to put up a station, you have to put up a tower and an antenna. Those things are not easily done. They're they they cost money. I could probably pull it off, but at my age, I don't know that a 
that's something that I want to I want to dedicate myself to. Now, we met at the Dayton Hamvention because I came up to your booth, and you had a company that you founded called Swap My Rig. What was Swap My Rig, and how did that come about? Well, over the years, I've always installed ham radios in my cars, HF radios and VHF, UHF radios. And I found that it was a real problem with installation because every company, every manufacturer had different cables to connect the control heads and the mics and the speakers to the radios. And when you change radios, you always had to run new cables. And that's not a trivial task to run cables. I've, my car, my current car, I can't put a radio in it because everything's so tight that there's no crevices to hide the wires in. But I wanted to develop a extension kit that would fit any radio, any ham radio, that with one cable, a single cable, you could connect any manufacturer's radio to its control head, speaker and, and, uh, um, and mic. And if you changed radios, if you swapped rigs, all you would have to do is change jumpers in a little box that would permit that configuration now to handle the inputs and outputs of the new radio. So I designed a, a circuit board that had 133 staking pins on it, edge, edge, edge connection pins. And on that circuit board, I connected, I connected the inputs from two RJ45 8-pin jacks, one of which would go to the radio's microphone jack, and the other would be to its control jack. And an RJ45 will fit any modern radio because in the last 15 years, nobody has, has except the Linko, has run with non-modular plugs. So Kenwood, Kenwood, Yesu, and ICOM all of their radios can be remoted by using RJ45 jacks and a, and a speaker jack, a sound jack. Some of the radios, I think, Bill, also, the microphone was plugged into the transceiver unit, not into the control head. That was a, an issue that people, it was a blessing in, and, it, and it, was, it was a curse because it meant that you had that mic hanging from this, this thing. You wanted the, maybe you wanted the, as, as I did, Maybe you wanted the control head sitting up in front of you, up on the uh, uh, up behind the steering wheel, uh, next to the windshield, and you didn't want to have a mic up there. So the Yesus, for example, the the uh, the eight thousand and the and the uh, seven thousand, they all had mics in the control head. That 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 was not a good market because you you only needed to run one set of wires for that radio, but, well, two wires. You needed a speaker and you needed needed the control head. But, again, you would have to change rigs. You'd have to change the cables to run for that. So you're right, You can, but you can do things with that RJ45 connector. You can run a USB connection from the radio to wherever you are. For example, if you're at home, and you've got, say, an ICOM 7100. ICOM 7100 has a, um, a USB connection on it. And um, you can control the mic. You can control the mic through the control head. So it's one of those where it's optional. You can either plug the mic into the radio or you can plug it into the control head. So um, you can use those, those con conductors that... Um, that would carry the mic, you can use those to, co to carry USB connection. Or in, in some cases, I did it so that it could take APRS, the Automatic Packet Reporting System uh, connections, uh, remote those. So th the idea was to have one cable that could handle any of modern radio. And that one cable I found was a v standard VGA cable. And a standard VGA cable is neat 
because IBM put three coaxial cables in it and four twisted pairs and then one separate wire. And that meant that I could put the mic in a, in a, uh, a coaxial cable, the mic return in the shield. I could take the, the clocking pulses and put those things in a coaxial cable. I could route the radio's uh, interference prone signals into these neat cables that are inside a VGA cable. And then on the other side, on the other side of the, of the VGA cable, you have a little box, the same box, and you, you translate those signals back out again. And there, there the radio's outputs are. RJ45 connectors, modular connectors again, and you just plug your control head into that, you plug your mic into that, and you plug your speaker into that, and it's just as if you plug them into the radio, but you have an ultra-shielded uh, stomp-proof cable that connects these two, install it once, you never have to install another one in your car or your RV or your boat or your house. We have guys that have just as an example, they've got, they've got TS-2000. Now, TS-2000 is, is a big rig, but it has a remotable head for it. And these people have their, there's three guys in the United States anyway that have remoted their TS-2000s 100 feet away from their house. They have them in, at the base, of, in a little ham shack at the base of their towers, and they run this VGA cable, which you can run underground and back up into the house and control it using the remote head. So it, for whether it's in your house or whether it's in your RV or your boat, your car, it's, it's the ability to remote those, those radios, put the antennas where the radio is and put the mic and the control head where you want to be. As I have right now, I have in my recliner here, I've got a, a, an ICOM 7100, IC7100, and I've got a, a Kenwood TMD710. And they're both connected with VGA cables from my ham shack, which is, well, it's actually not a shack, it's an attic that has the antenna ports in it. So all the, all the radios are in that antenna port area and all the controls are back here with me beside my recliner. And I enjoy the computer, uh, the FT8 work that I can do here. Um, it, and it's this one invention is what I call swap my rigs. And that's what I designed, manufactured, and sell. Okay, now, when we talked a week or two ago, it sounded to me like you're out of the business now. What's happening now with the Swap My Rig? The website is still up. It's still selling. But there's a transition that's going to take place. DX Engineering is going to take over the marketing. DX Engineering will have it in its catalog. And it will. when you order from DX Engineering, they will send me the information. And I will send you the units. So you're still manufacturing the units and do the order fulfillment? Yes. And I... I jumper them. They're they're jump. They come jumper for the radio you want. They're all set up. They're plug and play when you get them. And I test them. I have a microprocessor that tests all the connections and s s checks the resistance and makes sure that the system works. And then I ship them out. And for that, they get a, a share of the sales price. And I move my inventory. We will return to our guests in just a moment. Nuts and Volts Magazine is a new sponsor and is an amazing resource for new and old hams alike. Click on the banner to get your online or paper subscription of Nuts and Volts. A new way to show your support of the QSO Today podcast is to buy me a coffee. I consume gallons of coffee to create this weekly podcast. Invite me for coffee by pushing the yellow button, buy me a coffee, on the QSO Today show notes page. And now back to our QSO Today. Are all VGA cables created equal? No. The VGA cables have to be IBM spec. Over the years, the manufacturers have shortcutted and dumbed down the cable so that they only need, they only include in the cable those connections that run a monitor, that run 
uh, a standard monitor. They don't have, for example, this is this is the tragedy of the accountant trying to save money. They they take those shields on the on the three coaxial cables and they ground those things. And as a result, you have no conductor that's that's shielding that's shielding that microphone lead or that that clocking pulse. Those conductors are shot. They're gone. They also don't include pin number nine because pin number nine was a signaling pin that carried five volts for IBM for whatever purpose they had. But um, those don't, that's pin nine is not usually connected on on the cheap ones that you buy at, at Best Buy. But you can still get a cable wholesale or um, I don't know. I buy cables in bulk and I and I include them with the sale. I I don't want people trying to connect with their own with their own cables. And I have a guy in Reunion Island bought two units, two sets from me, and wanted to use his own VGA cables. And I assured him that he could he could try that, but it wouldn't work unless they were IBM spec. And so I had to ship him later. IBM spec cables um, at at my cost, which was it was not trivial. So you you lose money on that, but it, at least the guy who's in Reunion Island has remoted control heads. The third way, the the, the ways they omit cable nine, they ground the uh, the shields, and the third way is they use aluminum wire and the resistance of aluminum wire. That's okay for 15 feet, but when if you're trying to run in an RV or you're trying to run 100 feet, that's not going to work. So, and they're not twisted pairs. They don't include them as four twisted pairs. They just have them in the in the shield. I really don't sell the units without including the cable. If somebody wanted to do their own project, this is something I didn't know. If they were looking to buy. IBM spec VGA cables, that's what they should be looking for, right? They should probably get the schematic from the supplier to make sure that, in fact, that that VGA cable is actually three shielded wires inside with four twisted pairs, you know, with the data wire on pin nine. I mean, they should actually see perhaps a schematic of the cable that's being sold to them. Yes, and that's re- and that's readily available. Every, every uh, vendor that I go to I ask for the schematic, and I get a schematic. They're online, and uh, it's it's revealing to see how how those things. It, it's a it's a miracle that IBM created that just for me, and I appreciate that. Look, anybody that's used to looking at compact fluorescent lights, for example, or even these LED lights, where they come from China, where when you pull them apart, when they finally blow up, because at least the ones I get here. At some point, they blow up. If you take them apart, you'll realize that they pull parts off the board once it's working until it stops working, and then they put that one part back on. So you'll find that there are traces on the board where there are missing components in order to cheapen the product, but it still works to some degree. I kind of thought that LED light bulbs would last forever, but I find that they seem to have the same kind of life as incandescent bulbs. I've experienced the same thing. I've got bulbs around here where the the bulb part comes off, and um, and of course there's no way to put it back on again. So you do get a chance to look at what it, what they've got inside, and they do. They've taken off taken off the little LED bulbs that don't work, and shortens the output of the of the LEDs, but uh, they fail. That keeps them in business. I think I once read or I saw a YouTube video about creating the light bulb. Edison created the light bulb, but then when I think General Electric started making light bulbs, they had to figure out, well, what could we use now so that these bulbs have a limited life so that we can keep selling bulbs? Yes. Well, I I think the accountants, there, the MBAs and the the CPAs, they... <laughs> They figured out how to do it, and and those LEDs, I have them fail all the time. Let me ask a question. You pointed out that your current rig is the ICOM 7100 and the TMD 710. 
is that the ham shack at this point? Yes. Yes. I've, I've got three IC 7100s. One of them is, is a remote rig. I don't know if, if you're familiar with the remote rig, but it, it uses uh, ham radio outlet sells them, sells the units. So you, I have a, a small photography case that has the control head and has the little remote rig box. And I can take that anywhere I want to. And, and I'm connected to, to a home station. Oh, so you can travel to a hotel or something like that. Exactly. When I was up in Dayton, I was talking talking on the local repeater down here to, to guys and saying, what, what do you, what is it that you need and what can I look for for you? The whole way back, I, I was talking to people that, from Tallahassee when I was outside of Dayton and all the way back home. And what kind of antenna array do you have on your house? Oh, I have uh, a tri-band beam. Uh, What's well, not tri-band, it's got the work bands on it too. It's a Mosley TA33 Junior. Um, uh, I've got a uh, an M square uh, six meter beam, and I've got a a comet. I've got three VHF UHF antennas up there, all on the same tower, either either on standoffs or at the very top of the tower. Do you still climb your own towers? No, I have uh, a genetic disease that, unfortunately, my my I have no feeling in bottoms of my feet anymore. I used to run marathons, and now I can't walk. So that's my personal, uh, my, my old age is, is a vengeful thing. Um, so I don't climb my own tower, but I have, I have a lot of really special good friends who will climb for me. And uh, we just had a climbing recently because I'm, I'm putting up one of those new uh, six-meter antennas from England. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I don't I don't remember the name of it, but it's got a loop on it. So it's it's very directional. That's in the process of being put up. So uh, I do not answer your question. No, I don't climb it anymore. But I did put up my Rome 25 tower all by myself, lifting that sucker, those sections up for my this was uh, in 1974 when I first became a ham and built the house, uh, built the tower at the same time. What's your favorite operating mode? Well, right now I'm playing FT8 because it's uh, it's kind of a st- stupid me band. Uh, it's it's so simple to work, but you can really chalk up countries with it. It's it's an, uh, amazing how quickly I've I've been able to accumulate 100 countries on every band as I'm going through. And it's, it's, uh, to me, it's, it's a challenge keeping score. It's, it's like life. Life is a game. There's a set of rules. There's a winner and a loser. So you're like doing five-band DXCC? Yes. On FT8? On FT8, yes. And, and um, of course, back before FT8, I was, I was trying PSK31. That was a very efficient way to go, but I only have 100 watts, and I can't compete with those guys on sideband. I can never win that battle. These guys with their kilowatt and a half are working, and here I am stuttering on 100 watts, and it's not a battle I easily win. Why have you not become a high-power operator? Because of the way I have it set up, I have, I'm taking the outputs of my radios and doing things with them, I, I'm using a, a uh, for remoting the digital signal. I'm using a micro ham to I don't know if that's familiar. That's I don't want to get in the nomenclature. But to me, I have to have I have to have my rigs remoted, and I can't have a remote amp. I don't know how to do that. I haven't figured out a way that I can have a remote amp that would take my my existing uh, antenna tuners, they're all, they're all ICOM. Connected to the back of the radio. Yeah, and they use, the, they use the, that. I just can't find a remoted amplifier. Somebody will sell me a remoted amplifier that I don't, that I can just hook into the line and it will automatically sense whether I, what band I'm on. I know it 
they, they do that, but I haven't uh, I haven't been able to uh, drum up the courage to play that game. Although it's a nice game, it's a nice game to have the power. Yes, yes, I'd like to play that game. Maybe after the show, I'll send you an idea on where you might play that game. I don't want to say it on the air because without doing some research, I'm not sure that I'm actually right, but I think I've got a solution for you. Let me ask you, what do you think the greatest challenge is facing amateur radio now? Well, I think it's it's uh, bringing new people into the field. The elimination of the code requirement was probably the, the single best, even though it's, I, I considered it an anathema at the time, eliminating the code requirement. But to get to get the young people into into the into being interested in it, it's hard. The schools would like to have science and technology students. There there are not that many of them that I'm aware of. There's a, a lot of a lot of telephone phone communications, and and I'm shocked by not shocked. I'm I'm just disappointed to see the youth. Uh, not only the youth, but the people in general, focusing on their phones. Uh, I go to the gym three days a week, and uh, I I put a, a cartoon up that I, I thought was great because it had two entrances to the gym. One was for people who want to exercise, and the other who just want to sit on the machine and read their phones, because that's, that's uh, what I find young people doing, and they... They don't have. They don't think they have time to do anything that's going to be conducive to a career in electronics. I see that too. I mean, obviously, everywhere in the world, people are connected to their phones. I swim three times a week, and when I get out to cool down, I'm sitting there with a book. I feel like I'm kind of like this oddball out now because you don't see anybody reading books anymore. It's kind of like they're reading their phones. Maybe they're reading books on their phones, but. It doesn't look like people are reading books. And it's so interesting because when I'm on my ellipt- ellipt- elliptical at the gym, I have a book in front of me that I read while I'm while I'm doing my aerobic work. So I, I do understand what you're doing, and I share that passion for reading. People must be reading books because they think that we're printing more books now in the world than we ever have at a higher rate than we've ever had. I like the way they feel and smell and look. You know, it's kind of like... My idea of a vacation is just taking a bag of books and sitting someplace and reading them. So there must be people buying books. You may be an outlier, too. Could be. Could be. Okay, so what excites you the most about what's happening in amateur radio now? Well, the people, the friendships, the camaraderie, the the sense of fellowship that I'm sharing with so many of the hams. They're good guys, and they... They they will do anything for you, and you do anything for them, and that's almost a religious thing. Uh, that's to me, that's that's what I see the future of ham radio is. It used to be that it was an individual kind of thing that you you could you didn't have to face anybody. You could talk to them on the radio, but the more that I become saturated with the hobby, the more I realize that. You're not playing with an instrument. You're playing with the people that are on the other side of the instrument. And that's a real thrill. That's that's taking rocks out of a pitcher and, and filling it with a kind of fellowship that you don't get. You don't easily get. And you're always you can always communicate with these people. They're always around because you can you can talk to them on their radios. Well, I think in 415 interviews, I don't think I've had anybody say that that was the most exciting thing about amateur radio. But I would agree. You know, after doing 415 interviews, I would say that my faith in human beings is continually restored by my conversations that I have with ham radio operators. So it's kind of like you can read the news and you can be depressed. But then I have a conversation like this, Bill, and I think that everything's fine with the world for the most part. Because the foundation is solid. I think it is. And I think uh, when I get on the air, um, I always have I always have a good friend that I can talk to. And when even when I'm doing FT8, I, I see uh, people sending messages on FT8. Uh, I, of course, the Ukrainian situation is a very sad, 
tragic one as far as I'm concerned. And uh, I see people giving political messages back and forth on uh, on uh, on FTA. And I think, well, innovation is not dead. If you can if you can send messages using FTA, you're you're uh, uh, you've got something something in terms of redemption to you. That might be what JS8 call where they're actually doing that, or is that on FT8 itself? It's on FT8 itself. I'm admitting to everyone, I haven't done FT8 yet, so I guess I'm going to have to do it just so that I have something to talk about and some expertise. What advice would you give to newer returning hams? Get to know the get to know the other hams, and and they will they will equip you. They will. We have every ham after ten years has surplus equipment. Um, we we'd love to give it away to you. Absolutely right. I think I said this in 200 episodes. Nobody believes me, but I'm so glad that you're saying it. We all have stuff under our benches, in our attics, in our basements. Yes, and we'd love to. We'd love to separate ourselves from those things and and let somebody else get the joy that we had when we first acquired those things and thought that they were going to satisfy us for much more than they did. For for new people getting in, join a club, get involved. Get on the air. People say, get on the air with CW. I don't know. I, I still got my code speed, but um, I I still haven't gotten, I, I'm still timorous about getting into with these high speed guys um, with the code that people are sending. Uh, so I haven't, uh, I haven't done CW in a long, long time. So that's not really answering your question, but I would say get to know some ham or some hams that are knowledgeable and they will guide you through your problems. There, there's no problem that we haven't encountered that I'm aware of that that I can't I can't call somebody and and get an answer to it. We've got electrical engineers, we've got uh, scientists, we've, I've got a, an astronaut that lives next door who's a ham. There's so many people out there. There's no shortage of expertise, in other words. That's right, Eric. Well, Bill, I've really enjoyed this, and I knew I would. And I'm so happy that you came on the QSO Today podcast to tell us your story and kind of give us the sage advice. And with that, I want to thank you so much and wish you 73. 73. Thank you so much, Eric. I've enjoyed it. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Bill. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put an AE4S in the search box at the top of the page. Be sure to click on the Expo menu item at the top of the page for updates on the upcoming QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. I am updating it as I have more information. My thanks to ICOM America for its support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of ICOM America by clicking on their banner in the show notes pages. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any other episode into written text, please contact me. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes pages or use my Amazon link before shopping at Amazon. Amazon gives me a small commission on your purchases while at the same time protecting your privacy. I'm grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference as I head towards episode 500. QSO Today is now available in the iHeart, Radio, Spotify, YouTube, and a bunch of other online audio services, including the iTunes Store. Look on the right side of the show notes pages for a listing of these services. You can use the Amazon Echo and say, Alicia, play the QSO Today podcast from TuneIn. My thanks to Ben Bresky, who edits every single show and allows both this host and my guest to sound brilliant. Thanks, Ben. Until next time, this is Eric. 4Z1UG73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.